I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. You are listening to Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton. This is a special episode in which Max Blumenthal is reporting from on the ground inside Nicaragua. And in this episode, he debunks a lot of the talking points we've been hearing about the recent unrest in Nicaragua in Western corporate media outlets. Particularly, Max outlines how there has been an attempted right-wing U.S.-backed coup against the Sandinista government. And Max has an informative interview with Nils McCune, who is a researcher who actually lives in Nicaragua, unlike many of the Western journalists who have been misleadingly reporting on what's been going on with a pro-opposition narrative. We'll cut directly to Max's report from inside Nicaragua, but first, here's a clip from that interview. Well, I remember the first uh, reports when people started writing me from all over the world and saying, hey, what the hell's going on there? Are there protests? Is the government killing people? And, you know, from the beginning, it was clear the right wing was pretty involved in in the very beginning of, of what was happening here. So I told people, no, this is just... You know, it's it's an attempt to to uh, move the waters a little bit. It's an attempt for these NGOs that are sponsored by uh, the United States and the European Union to try to make sure that they get those grants for next year. Uh, I never thought that they uh, that making a splash would turn into a full scale regime change operation. Uh, but from the beginning, there were also people telling me, hey, look, but friends of mine on the left or friends of mine who are in Nicaragua in the 1980s or people who are really progressives are all saying that this is real, this is a protest movement, and uh, the government's being repressive. So from the first moment living here, it was very clear that the, it was a right-wing operation to uh, make some waves, but it was also clear that this had the potential to divide the international left. Okay, so it's July 26th. This is Moderate Rebels. I'm Max Blumenthal. This is the 65th anniversary of the assault on the Moncada barracks by Fidel Castro and a group of compañeros in Cuba. Back in 1953, that was the first shot of the Cuban Revolution. Actually, Fidel Castro was jailed and released only thanks to the intervention of Lázaro Cárdenas, who is the founder of the PRD party, which uh, was also the party of AMLO, who is the newly elected president of Mexico through the Moreno Party. So a lot of developments in Latin America. As I mentioned, I'm here in Nicaragua, uh, which has just celebrated the 39th anniversary of the Sandinista Revolution, the defeat of the dictatorship of Anastasio Somoza. And this anniversary occurred on a very momentous date this year because it also marked the defeat of a U.S.-backed coup attempt, which something that can only be described as a coup attempt, another regime change operation modeled partly after the color revolutions that we saw in Eastern Europe, Gene Sharp style, uh, with elements of Syria and Libya mixed in. And I'm going to talk about that with my friend Nils McCune, who has been living in Nicaragua for several years and has been working with the rural campesino movement, who lives in Tipitapa um, and has lived through a very precarious few months. And I'm also here with uh, Nora McCurdy, who grew up in Nicaragua and uh, may weigh in on this discussion and who also has a really bad cough. Um, So you might be hearing some of that as well. Uh, But first, uh, Nils, I want to just ask you, um, you know, how did you wind up in Nicaragua? Talk about a little, talk a little bit about the work you've been doing here, and then we can get into um, the events that began this April. Sure. Thanks, Max. So I come from a, a labor background in the United States and, uh, As a kid, I I started to get more interested in the environmental question and the question of food because it seems to be a way that uh, people can become politicized in an important way. So uh, I guess in in my university education, I started working on something called agroecology, which is the idea of how we can feed ourselves as as peoples without destroying the planet, without uh, requiring resources from other countries or or, uh, other places. And that work uh, first led me to do a master's degree in Cuba, which is uh, the country that has the most advances in agroecology in the world based on their special period. 
and how they've been able to creatively get past the blockade put on them by the United States. And uh, in 2012, I, I came to Nicaragua, which is a country that has uh, a long agrarian history, the land reform of the 1980s during the Sandinista Revolution, and has sort of the potential to be the country within Central America that can produce its own food. So uh, right now, Nicaragua produces between 80 and 90 percent of its own food. And the last few years, I've been working at uh, four different schools that the Via Campesina has here for social movement youth to learn the technical but also the political aspects of agroecology. Okay, so you were basically in a strategically important location when an, a coup attempt began, uh, something that was regarded uh, in Western media as an uprising. The New York Times has called it resistance. Um, I think in an article in uh, the magazine edited by former Israeli prison guard Jeffrey Goldberg um, has referred to it as sort of a moment of democratic potential. Uh, this began on April 18th. Uh, wh what did you see? Well, I remember the first uh, reports when people started writing me from all over the world and saying, hey, what the hell's going on there? Are there protests? Is the government killing people? And, you know, it's a small country here. We all kind of know who's who. And uh, from the beginning, it was clear the right wing was pretty involved in, in the very beginning of, of what was happening here. So I told people, no, this is just, you know, it's it's an attempt to, to uh, move the waters a little bit. It's an attempt for these NGOs that are sponsored by uh, the United States and the European Union to try to make sure that they get those grants for next year. Uh, I never thought that they uh, that making a splash would turn into a full-scale regime change operation. Uh, but from the beginning, there were also people telling me, hey, look, but friends of mine on the left or friends of mine who are in Nicaragua in the 1980s or people who are really progressives are all saying that this is real, this is a protest movement, and uh, the government's being repressive. So from the first moment living here, it was very clear that the, it was a right-wing operation to... Uh, make some waves, but it was also clear that this had the potential to divide the international left. Well, that division has taken place, and I think we can get into that, or it's, you know, it's pretty easy for it to, for the gulf to widen. Um, you know, we'll talk, we'll talk about that down the line in this discussion, but I mean, wh what happened on April 18th? Um, a lot of younger Sandinistas refer to a you know, massive media manipulation. Um, there were events around the public university at Upoli um, where it was said that a student had died. The student turned up alive the next day. Uh, then three pe people were killed on April 19th, and they all turned out to be on the, the government side or, or, or bystanders. Um, correct me if I'm wrong and tell me exactly um, how this began and what took place over the next day, few days and, and what it was like. What was it? What was it like for you being in Tipi Tapa? You described it um, in a conversation we had earlier this week as apocalyptic. Yeah, so it's interesting looking back. You know, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty, and there were several um, sort of like dress rehearsals for the regime change operation that happened earlier this year. First, there was uh, a, a spattering of news across the country of uh, child abductions and the national police had to come out several times with public statements saying this isn't real news this is something that's getting spread on on social media nothing to be concerned about and then uh, in the very beginning of april i think it was or the very end of march a fire broke out during the hot dry season of nicaragua in a very important forest reserve that's in the southeast part of Nicaragua called Indio Maiz, which has, uh, it's like a biodiversity hotspot, part of the lungs of Mesoamerica. And this fire, which was started by a young farmer who was uh, burning an area to plant with rice, got out of control. And, you know, it's an area where there's no roads, and to travel there uh, would require some combination of air and uh, small boats. So the Nicaraguan government had a very difficult time containing the fire for the first five or six days. Uh, th there were experts who thought that this fire would last for several months. 
and a protest movement erupted of well-to-do university students in Managua uh, closing roads, shutting down traffic, and complaining that the Nicaraguans had not accepted the help of 60 Costa Rican firefighters. Uh, there's a lot of details to all that because Costa Rica and Nicaragua have a long history. Costa Rica uh, took some land from Nicaragua last time it intervened here. So when the Nicaraguans said no to the 60 uh, military firefighters, uh, it was because what Nicaragua needed at, the, at that time were airplanes that would allow it to put out the fire. So that fire luckily uh, went out on its own pretty much after a rainstorm. And then just a week later, uh, COSEP, which is the organization of uh, business owners, it's sort of like the Chamber of Commerce here, walked out on negotiations with the government and with labor unions about a new law around Social Security. So the Social Security system here in Nicaragua is public, but it's been running a loss of nearly $80 million per year. There was a need to find a solvency, uh, and the IMF had asked Nicaragua to uh, raise the retirement age and pretty much doubled the number of weeks that a worker would need to pay into the system to be able to have a retirement check. The Nicaraguan government had its own counterproposal was uh, which was to maintain the retirement age at 60 years old, to maintain the number of weeks that people would need to work, also to maintain a um, a partial pension that's available for people who are, were affected by the Civil War here in the 1980s, uh, and to increase the amount that people would pay from their paychecks by 0.75%. Uh, to increase the amount that employers would pay by, I believe it's 2.5%, and to increase the amount that the government would pay from uh, zero to 0.5%, I believe. So there were these very slight increases all around, but the largest increase on employers. And also the reform would have uh, ended a loophole that allowed high-income individuals to claim a low-income in, a, in order to uh, access health benefits. So it's a, there's some details to the reform, but what's interesting is that the, uh, the, the empresarios here, the, the Chamber of Commerce, COSEP, called for protests, and the next day there were protests of these same uh, mostly middle-class university students from private universities who had protested the fire. You know, it's very unlikely that they knew what the reform even consisted of at that time, but on April 18th, they did protest. What happened next uh, is really incredible, Max, because we started getting hit up on our cell phones, uh, on WhatsApp accounts and Facebook by all kinds of frantic messages uh, that night and all day the next day, uh, talking about repression, talking about a student being killed, uh, and on Facebook, uh, paid advertisements and sponsored content that called people to rise up in arms against the police. Let me see if I can play one of those right now. Muchachos, muchachos, escúchenme todo. Mi nombre es Bruce Steven. Repito, mi nombre es Bruce Steven. Estamos encerrados en el edificio de la Upoli. Estamos encerrados. Necesitamos ayuda. Nos tiene la juventud sandinista. Los antimotines nos están tirando disparos. Estamos nerviosos, todos estamos nerviosos. Si pueden escuchar detonaciones, estamos encerrados en el edificio I de la Poli. Nos van a quemar los Poli con nosotros adentro. <laughs> Ayúdenme, rezo por nosotros. So what the hell was that? It sounds like, uh, you know, a little bit phony to me. Yeah, so Max, you have to understand the context here. Nicaragua is a very safe country. It's a place where... People have been studying. In fact, it's been a place where people from around Central America have started to send their kids to study because it's such a safe country. And this recording obviously breaks all of that, right? So what it's saying, it's a voice saying, he introduces himself. He says, look, we need help. We're uh, students trapped inside Upoli. Outside are Sandinista youth and riot police. And they're going to burn our building with all of us locked up inside here. So please help. Pray for us. And in the background, you start to hear these these sounds of explosions. Right as he says, we can hear explosions. You start hearing explosions. I mean, for me, listening to it, I, I can just imagine somebody at a mixing table, you know, cueing the explosions. It's a joke, 
right? It's a fake, uh, fake recording. We've interviewed someone who was there at Upoli at the time, whose mom heard this, called her frantically and said, is this really happening? And she said, no, we're, we're here, we're protesting, uh, but we're fine. So what we have is, you know, a partial truth where there were students who were protesting the reforms of Eints without necessarily knowing what they were protesting, but feeling like the process hadn't included them, that they hadn't been properly consulted. But then that gets mixed in with this fake news saying that there's a police um, massacre of students, which for you know anyone who has a conscience is a very, very hard thing. No one could accept that, right, in this country. So that's uh, this was the 19th of April, right? And that night, there are uh, conflicts in several cities of Nicaragua as people start to throw stones at police and uh, attack the uh, the Ince buildings and try to burn them with Molotov, talk, uh, Mol- Molotov cocktails. And uh, in Tipitapa, a young man uh, was killed, a Sandinista youth was killed, and, and it's still not totally clear how he died. Uh, it seems that he may have been protesting. Uh, but it's not it's not clear. There were people who were protesting in Tipitapa who were given arms by a local anti-Sandinista politician. Uh, there was a police officer who was killed near Upoli, and somewhere else in Managua, I'm not sure where, there was a worker who was killed. So on April 8, 19th, there were three deaths, and on the morning of the 20th, all of those deaths were reported in the media here as repression. So the 20th and the 21st were days of uh, full-scale riots across Nicaragua and uh, young people having uh, confrontations with police and also young people protesting for peace. So there was, it was interesting that the Sandinistas rallied more people. Each of those days, there were more people rallying in support of the INS reforms and uh, in support of peace than there were against the INS reforms and looking to burn alcaldías and, and burn down uh, public buildings. But, of course, all of this got uh, swept into this media narrative that just talked about repression of peaceful protesters. Um, next, you had, well, first of all, let, let's uh, put the, uh, the Upoli occupation in context. Uh, this became a base of operations for the opposition, and this is a public university, uh, one of the two main public universities in Managua that really serve the poor and working class uh, people from all around, young people from all around Nicaragua, all the way to Bluefields, you know, Leon, wherever. And they were not able to go to school, and their schools were being trashed. Um, who, who was at Upoli? Um, who was in the building? Uh, we, you know, I got to meet uh, Veronica Gutierrez and Leonel Morales, who were two students who Leonel opened the door for the quote unquote students who came into Upoli. He was a student union leader. He's now in the hospital, um, and we can talk about him later. Basically, he was um, nearly killed and thrown in a ditch for turning against the opposition. But who was in Up- Upoli? Um, and who is Felix Maradiaga? What was he doing there? Mm-hmm. This is a really key figure in the whole story. And what was going on on the third floor of Upoli? I think you can kind of tell the whole story of this coup attempt if you start from there. Sure. So the thing to remember here is that each day that passes, you know, the government is sort of trying to figure out what the hell is going on and respond to whatever happened the day before. And meanwhile, there's and a, a very elaborate plan for each day. So what happened with Upoli is that uh, there was fake news of a student death on April 18th. People started receiving that, that news in the evening time. People are talking about it, concerned about it. Students want to show their solidarity. So April 19th, the students of Upoli decide that they're going to have a march. They tell uh, Leonel, who's their president, look, isn't the student union going to support us? So he uh, marches with the students, and, and as the student union, there, there's a march uh, really to sort of clear up the question of the student uh, who was reported to be killed. After that march ended, there was a whole other group of people who arrived outside of Upoli and started getting in a, in a conflict with police officers who started throwing rocks at cops, who started um, 
trying to create a battle sort of a situation. So because the police used tear gas that day uh, and people were being affected by the tear gas, Leonel opened up the gates of the university to allow people who were fighting against the police to enter into the university. Nicaragua has a lot of university autonomy, so that means that the police officers are not allowed to enter the university unless they have the permission of the chancellor. So the protesters sort of took refuge in the university. The police stayed outside. And so this mix of students and non-students are in the university for several days. And as Veronica and Leonel told us, each day uh, the operation started to take form. So immediately, you know, rather than, I guess, neighbors who were feeling solidarity and bringing a, a plate of food, they were getting truckloads of food. They were getting truckloads of clothing so that they wouldn't have to leave the university. They were getting uh, lots of money. They were starting to get morteros. So morteros are mortar launchers. It's a traditional sort of homemade weapon here uh, that you know shoots off a, a ball of gunpowder, which is not a very effective weapon for killing somebody, but it, it'll sure make people keep their distance because it can it can kill somebody, but it can you know destroy your face or or break a rib. So these sort of makeshift weapons started showing up. Uh, truckloads of rocks started showing up. Very large amounts of money started showing up. And after uh, Daniel Ortega gave a speech calling for peace and calling for dialogue and uh, reversing the decision to reform the INTS, to reform the, the social security system, the student union said, okay, let's meet with everybody else who's here. So they had a meeting with uh, groups that call themselves civil society that had been present in Upoli agitating for months before uh, the, the, these protests started in April. And at that meeting, uh, the student union said, look, this is great if you guys want to continue to protest, but because they've rescinded the reform, uh, the protest needs to leave the university now. Right, because we have a university, we have a uh, responsibility towards our university to make sure it doesn't get destroyed, to make sure people don't miss too many classes. So take your protest somewhere else. And upon uh, this conversation finishing, these two, two, these two student leaders who we were able to talk to uh, learned from the security guards at the university that a group had entered into the university armed looking for them. Uh, because they weren't going to let these uh, university leaders push out the movement, uh, the protest movement. So the, the student leaders escaped. They made a, a press statement that said, look, we're the student union. Uh, we left with our students, and those who continue to be in Upoli are not students. Uh, so that was this initial sort of um, uh, slap in the face of the coup attempt, right, because... The, the, the coup from the beginning had the strategy to take over university spaces, which be, by law here, uh, police can't get into. So it would allow them to sort of create an operation. So the operation they created was through uh, this very interesting figure named Felix Mariaga, who's a uh, Harvard-trained, U.S.-raised Nicaraguan, uh, who has also, he's an Aspen fellow, and who has been a hardcore opposition leader for several years here, but through a very sort of highbrow uh, NGO called EEP, which is a Institute for Economic Studies and Public Policy, which sort of talks about um, community safety, uh, studies of crime, and uh, different sorts of public policy in the country. Uh, its main emphasis has been to try to uh, end the armed forces in Nicaragua, to try to propose that the military uh, would be dismantled here. So for many years, this has functioned as sort of a, a mouthpiece for a Washington policy uh, that would disable Nicaragua's ability to um, stop the sort of imperial will here, because obviously a country that has a, an independent foreign policy and its own army is more powerful than a country without an army. But this guy, in the moment that the, uh, that the conditions produce sort of a, a, a social rupture and you know everybody in the country is getting bombarded with fake news, starts to deliver uh, money, uh, 
and weapons to Upoli. So there's photos of him with armed men and a very important uh, organized crime figure installs himself in Upoli, a guy named Viper. Uh, that's his code name. Uh, he was there for several weeks. The the uh, state media started reporting on his presence in Upoli, and the opposition media denied it. And then finally this guy was, uh, he left Upoli and was subsequently arrested. Uh, when he was arrested, Felix Mardiaga uh, sent out a tweet to his fans saying, let's all go and uh, g demand that our prisoners be released from Chipote. But then, of course, he said he had never heard of uh, Viper and didn't know who he was. But Viper gave a very, very interesting uh, declaration in which he said, yeah, my job was to foment crime across Managua to create panic, uh, including carjackings, including uh, assaults, and even murder. And uh, he said, yeah, the one who was telling me what to do was Felix Maradiaga. So it's a phenomenal situation here where we have someone who is the closest opposition figure to U.S. intelligence, the uh, very highbrow, you know, Aspen fellow, who is ordering hits in Managua and who's ordering carjackings and who's ordering arson, all to create panic to try to put the population into a confused state which would allow uh, the opposition to take over the government here. And it nearly did. However, I think one of the fatal flaws was the lack of public support. The public basically rejected this, uh, these criminal elements. Um, <clears throat> just quickly about Felix Maradiaga, and I think we can talk a little bit more about him. I tried to go to his office the other day um, at YEP, which is I-E-E-P-P. -P. I've written about him at the Gray Zone Project in an article on how the National Endowment for Democracy has boasted of laying the groundwork for insurrection. Um, basically, Mara Diaga is the main contact for the National Endowment for Democracy, which is the regime change arm of the U.S. government. It has been responsible for funding opposition movements that have led regime change operations, some of them known as color revolutions, across the world, including in Mongolia, where it smashed the legacy of socialism and installed a right-wing libertarian government um, that's responsible for record inequality in that country. Uh, there are so many countries where the NED has been responsible for destabilization uh, under the guise of spreading democracy and human rights. Uh, from 2014 to 2017, the National Endowment for Democracy dumped about $4.1 million into Nicaraguan opposition media. Um, it's been active in the country since the 80s uh, when it started supporting the Contras through a front group run by Oliver North. Um, and Felix Maradiaga, just to wrap up the story, he wasn't at his office in this really wealthy neighborhood of Managua. It was completely shuttered because he was in Washington with his crew meeting with Mark Green, who's the director of USAID, which is another U.S. government body that funds opposition groups in Nicaragua to secure $1.5 million for more, I guess, for, you know, for the coup 2.0, the next round. I don't know if Mara Diago will be back, but he was seen at Upoli with a beard uh, next to armed figures, uh, figures carrying guns. Um, this is vi on video. It's widely available. Everyone in Nicaragua has seen it. In Washington, they haven't seen it. He shaved his beard, and he kind of looks like pretty legit. You know, he looks like he could be, uh, you know, Marco Rubio's legislative aide. Also at the table at the USAID meeting was uh, Victor Quadras, who was one of the students, the original students who were kind of revered as the defenders of democracy here. Most of those students or many of them come from UCA, University of Central America, which is a private school that serves the wealthier population here. Um, and so you do have a class divide among the students, the students at Upoli and at UNAN, um, which is another public, big public university that's one of, really rep reflects the legacy of, of Sandinismo, um, was utterly ransacked. And I got to visit the campus the other day. Um, I think any 
American who cares about public education would have been shocked to see what was done to this school by armed elements and these so-called students who occupied it and just trashed the women's dorms. They demolished uh, the reproductive health center, which was providing free health care, including OBGYN and um, rehabilitation um, services to the local community. They just trashed it. Um, they burned the child care center, which served 300 children who were the children of the staff. And that was because that was the base of operations for the armed elements. And I was easily able to find homemade grenades just lying around there. And two students were on, uh, on hand to really emphasize their resentment of these more privileged students and the criminal gangs who protected them. Uh, who destroyed their school and it prevented them from going back to class for at least six months. Um, and it's not just them. You know, you have students from other parts of the country who relied on Unan in order to get internet, which they don't have at home. And it was it's something, you know, I've been noticing when I talk to working people here. You know, you talk to anyone who drives a taxi or sells food in the street or anything or who runs a shop and they say, you know, I couldn't afford to go on strike. I have to work. The people who can afford to not work for a while, the upper class, the upper middle class, to the extent that it exists, they're the ones who could afford to do so. And those are the students who could study at home uh, on because they have wireless connections. The other students couldn't. So, you know, I mean, you can definitely speak to that. Um, speak to the class divide, but let's also talk about the role of the Catholic Church here, because um, the Catholic Church was supposed to serve, first of all, a national dialogue was called by President Daniel Ortega, um, where the students, um, Lester Aleman, another one of these students who appears to have been you know, involved in National Endowment for Democracy training courses, they've trained over 5,000 young people here, according to one of the trainees I met. Uh, um, the national they made the call for regime change in the national dialogue on one of the in one of the first sessions they said the only way we're going to stop these protests is if you leave mr president um the catholic church was supposed to be mediating these they're supposed to be a force for peace for de-escalation but instead we saw the catholic church at violent roadblocks with priests egging on uh armed elements um we saw silvio baez who is the most important Catholic official in Nicaragua, tweeting pretty much calls for regime change. Um, and the bishops just clamoring for the president to go while posing as mediators. So talk a little bit more about the role of the Catholic Church. They were recently portrayed by this parachute New York Times journalist as uh, you know fighting for democracy in Nicaragua. That isn't really the um, what I've gotten from talking to people who have had direct contact with the priests during these last few months. Yeah, I think what's interesting about a coup that's not a direct military coup is that uh, it depends on manipulation and it depends on lies. And so what we saw here was a, uh, a very polished opposition that would show up in the national dialogue, which was called for by the president, uh, who also invited the Catholic hierarchy to, to mediate the dialogue. The opposition, which in the dialogue called itself the Civic Alliance for uh, Justice and Democracy, was made up of sort of a who's who of uh, aristocracy and oligarchy families, um, people who are heads of NGOs that accept money from the U.S. government, and this group of students that call themselves the 19th of April movement. So what's what's interesting about the way these work is that there's a need for one clean-cut sort of opposition, which can talk to the cameras, and then a very, very violent opposition that can control the streets and the cities. And what we, I think the mistake that was made here by the opposition was to try to do a lot without counting on popular support. And uh, without popular support, they had to resort to hiring gangsters, uh, using paid pickets, uh, buying weapons to arm the opposition, and starting to create spaces for drug gangs to take over these armed roadblocks that you mentioned, Max. So, tranques. the tranques, the famous tranques. This country was trancado, which means that the tranques uh, prevented 
transportation. They prevented people from getting to work. They became centers for crime, uh, petty crime, like robberies and forced toll for workers who needed to cross a tranquet to get to work, but also uh, hate crimes, including uh, rape, including uh, beatings of Sandinistas, public torture, uh, all kinds of humiliation. People were stripped naked and painted in, in the blue and white colors of the national flag. And some people were burned. So from this phase of sort of uh, total mani uh, mediatic manipulation uh, ab around something that pretended to be a student protest, the, the, the coup attempt here at the same time as the national dialogue began shifted into a new phase which was based on very aggressive street tactics to sort of keep trap people where they were, to only let non-Sandinistas move around freely. Uh, but they didn't even allow non-Sandinistas to move around freely. They, they forced Sandinistas and non-Sandinistas to feel fear in the streets. And that was something new here in Nicaragua. So from this first moment when I'd say probably 90% of the population uh, who had received these messages was sure that the police or Daniel Ortega had ordered some heinous crime. Over the next month, and as the national dialogue started to take form, and you see people like Lester Aleman uh, really sort of positioning themselves to be a future candidate rather than trying to propose anything interesting for the country, while the government at this dialogue had very... Um, thoughtful responses, showed a, a real clear interest in the dialogue succeeding, and the Catholic Church as mediator sort of, uh, you know, sending out these incredible tweets uh, warning the president that if he uh, didn't leave the country and re uh, resign, that he and his family could be murdered. So there's bizarre stuff coming out of the priests. So as this phase sort of took hold, many, many people started to see the opposition as, as their kidnappers who were holding them away from work, who were, who were keeping them from seeing their kids, who were putting them in danger. And it became clear that these tranques were being financed and were being attended to logistically by the Catholic Church in each city. Um, many of the people who were working on the tranques were altar boys. The people who were bringing food to the tranques were uh, church workers. The people who would bring the tranques back once the population would rise up and push them out using their own mortar launchers, the priests would come back and uh, lead the, the march of tranquistas, the, the roadblock uh, criminals, to take their role, again, uh, closing off traffic. So we saw all of these things, and the a population that really, at, at, for a week or two, was convinced that the government had committed these heinous crimes, started to see that they were dealing with a very manipulative opposition, uh, with a two-faced church, with a uh, private industry which had betrayed its very beneficial relationship with the government, and uh, student movement which really wasn't made up of students. So one by one, the pillars of the, of the coup attempt started to fall, and, you know, the, this Gene Sharp model, right, is to, to knock out the pillars of support for a government. And one of the key elements is to, uh, to, to plant distrust in the police. So that's been, I think, the, the major element of this coup attempt is to try to plant distrust in the police. I think they hoped that the army would come out onto the streets because they, there was so much violence in the streets uh, the National Dialogue, the f very first day of the National Dialogue, the bishops, the students, the NGO leaders had one demand, which was all of the police into their barracks. So the, the government complied with that demand, asking only for the tranques to be removed. The opposition didn't want to remove the tranques. And so what we had over the next week was tranques set up everywhere across the country because the opposition was working basically in conditions of impunity and hate crimes proliferated across the country. There were uh, many, many Sandinistas who had their houses burned and ransacked in those weeks. Uh, thousands of Sandinistas went underground to try to prevent themselves and their families from being hurt. People moved from house to house. Uh, there were daily and nightly vigils 
by workers and uh, sympathizers of the government to make sure that the San Anissa headquarters in each town weren't burned down. Over this, these weeks, I think there was a total of about 65 government buildings burned across the country. Uh, dozens of San Anista headquarters in different towns were burned down. And, you know, no other party has been attacked. No human rights organization has had its offices attacked. No opposition uh, NGO has been attacked. Only the San Anista front, and as you mentioned, you know, universities, public infrastructure... The, the right the uh, uh, a Sandinista radio station which is independent but has a leftist focus, so this turned into this massive, shocking and terrifying wave of of terror and hatred towards leftists and towards Sandinistas across the country, and, and that lasted for a very long time because the police were in their barracks. Uh, I think the order from the government was to not let the police leave their barracks until the population was really sure that the police weren't the ones who were committing these crimes because even as these hate crimes were being committed, all of the opposition media and all of its social media strength were telling people that these were acts of... Uh, s these, these were either self-attacks of San Anises against themselves to be able to justify attacks against peaceful protesters or they... Uh, they would switch the identity so that the Sandinista who had been killed would now be counted as a peaceful protester uh, who was the victim of government repression. So you have this incredible situation of manipulation that's happening at the same time as a, a wave of hate crimes against Sandinistas. And really, Max, that was what we all lived through for many weeks, and it was terrifying. And this story hasn't been told in the U.S. It's almost like uh, there is a deliberate cover-up. Um, having been here, it's amazing to actually look into the eyes and hear the voices of people who were tortured, brutally tortured, simply for being Sandinista. Um, I was I arranged uh, to meet some of them. There, many of their stories had been reported in local media. Um, so I knew some of their names. Um, I wanted to meet one person in particular, Sander Bonilla, who was tortured on camera with a Catholic priest presiding directly over the torture, um, just on camera. Um, wasn't reported in the U.S. I don't know why. His testimony hasn't been recorded by any human rights group. I don't know why. Well, of course I know why. He's an inconvenient victim for Washington, which... It just for some reason seeks to destabilize this country. Um, so I go to meet Sander Bonilla in the city hall in Managua, and the entire room is filled with people who are desperate to talk to some reporter who would listen to them because no Western reporter had bothered to come here and talk to them. No human rights group had bothered to talk to them. The whole room's packed. Uh, I'm with... Uh, you know, my f friend Thomas Hedges, we're recording a lot of what we've seen here on camera. We're going to work on a documentary soon. Um, and we had just a limited amount of time to take people into a room and record what they had to say on camera. And one after another, they would sit at a desk with us and break down in tears, describing how they were brutally tortured by opposition criminals for the crime of being Sandinista. Uh, starting with Sander Bonilla, who said that he had plast burning plastic bags dripped on his skin after he was kidnapped at a tranque and taken to an unknown location with a mask over his head, and that the priest who presided over his torture has been since uh, imploring him to rescind his testimony while opposition media says that he's a liar. He showed me his wrists, which still bore the scars of the rope that was used to tie him up. Um, I s s listened to an entire family break down in tears, describing how they were kidnapped and tortured. Um, the father was missing an eye. Uh, his father was, had bandages all over his legs. Um, the son had a giant scar on his face. And the mother did the talking while the father, the son, and the grandfather sobbed behind her. Why? I, I, it's just unbelievable uh, that everywhere I've went, I meet people like that, including randomly. I went to Messiah, which is the city where the opposition attempted to declare a junta, 
much as the Syrian opposition set up uh, rebel-controlled zones in places like East Aleppo and Idlib, um, Raqqa, where ISIS declared its capital. And, you know, East Aleppo's occupation by uh, Gulf-funded rebels started with a version of the tranke. They started setting up roadblocks and boxing the area in, uh, keeping everyone out so they could develop their own narrative, which was repeated faithfully by Western reporters. That's what the opposition attempted to do in Masaya, which is a city about 35 minutes from Managua, a city of 80,000. Uh, its most densely populated area is Monimbo, and this meant that it was the most easy place to strangle with the, th- with the tranque, and the most ferocious roadblocks were set up there with armed gangs who would extort motorists and terrorize the local population, particularly those like Emilio Alarcón, who are Sandinista, who was pulled out of his house and smashed in his face. He lost five teeth. I met him. He had stitches. Um, you know, he, he was better, but he showed me photographs of his face, and it looked like, a, you know, like a stromboli. He said, they just beat me because I'm Sandinista and I'm Sandinista because they put a roof over my head. They gave us electricity and they paved this street. You know, a lot of these areas, they, uh, and I've been, I was here 12 years ago in Nicaragua and I'd been to these areas and they didn't have paved streets then under the neoliberal government of Bolaños. And that's partly why there's deep support for the Sandinistas. So, you know, I read this um, piece today on NACLA, which is considered a left-wing journal on um, Latin America by this professor, I don't remember his name, Professor Schmagegi, I don't remember his name, from Indiana University. And, you know, he starts off by quoting, you know, the MRS people who are the former Sandinistas and how they say bad things about Daniel Ortega. And he follows the usual script. He dismisses the U.S. role in the coup. And then he ends by saying, shame on you, uh, Mr. Ortega. How dare you remove those courageous roadblocks at Monimbo? You know, this professor who's sitting in an office in, in, in Indiana. You know, and I would just love uh, for his campus to be occupied by the kind of people that occupied Upoli and Unan. I would love to see uh, his streets, the streets around his campus, uh, strangled with tranques by the Bundy militia and MS-13 or whatever gang you can think of. And I wonder what this professor would ask of his government or what any American would ask of their government. I think they would be calling for black helicopters with federal agents rappelling into these opposition areas so fast uh, there wouldn't even be time for the opposition to mobilize. It would never be allowed to happen in this country, especially 40 minutes from Washington. And we saw the same scenario in Syria uh, where rebels, so-called rebels from Jaysh al-Islam, the Saudi-backed militia had taken over an area just east of Damascus and were using it to launch attacks on Syria's capital and even fire at civilian aircraft. And Americans had no idea that their government and its allies were supporting that kind of thing. But they, they have to put it in context. How would you feel if this was happening in your neighborhood? Nicaraguans rep- re- rejected it. And Nils, I want to ask you to speak to the kind of the, the, the public mobilization because... You know, this has been presented as a government against the people. I don't think these tranques would have been defeated without massive public mobilization. Um, Some people refer to Sandinista paramilitaries, um, but we know that the police, because of a demand in the national dialogue, were ordered to stay in their stations for a month and a half or two months and were not able to go out and take out the roadblocks. And so average citizens started taking them on as well. So speak about what you saw in Tipi Tapa and elsewhere um, as far as public mobilization. Yeah, thanks, Max. It's so complex because there were there were phases, right? This, this coup attempt has gone through so many phases by now. So there was this moment, you know, when uh, the roadblocks ha- have taken over the country, the police are in their stations, crime is... Uh, you know, especially around the roadblocks, is becoming something that's just abominable. There was a there was a ten year old girl uh, who was raped at a roadblock in in Tipi Tapa in the community of Las Maderas, and uh, you know, Sandinistas are starting to talk to each other, and they say, "Look, there's you know, we haven't been told anything by the government. This national dialogue doesn't seem to be going anywhere. We everyone knows the role that the church is playing." Uh, Sandinistas' houses are being marked with these very eerie 
pastel colors, these three dots of pastel colors. Uh, Thomas has taken some images of them, so you guys will get a chance to see them in the documentary. But, you know, Santa Anisa's houses are marked across the town, and at least five or six in each town have been burned down. Santa Anisa's are, are really under attack, and it's a life and death thing. I've, n- I've never lived through something like this before. Uh, everybody who I knew started, you know, uh, sharpening a branch or carrying a knife around with them. And then the next week, a knife wasn't enough because uh, the opposition had moved from mortar launchers to rifles, pistols, and AK-47, you know, weapons. It was a a very, very strange moment um, where we really, really felt like we were under attack. You know, I couldn't leave my town. I couldn't leave my town for 80 days. I had looked at flights. I had a a work opportunity. I, I missed two plane flights. Um, I was looking at ways that my, I could get my family out via water because there's a large lake uh, in Nicaragua. But the case is there was no way out. Uh, and in this moment, you know, San Anissa started to get together. People were talking and, and they were doing these nightly vigils around some of the key spaces in each city to make sure that uh, the opposition wasn't able to just destroy the entire public infrastructure because really the idea is not just to take out one government and put in another it's to prevent Nicaragua from ever having a strong state again so in this context uh, yeah people organized there were first there were cases you know before the roadblocks became so armed in which women organized and pushed out a roadblock uh, merchants organized people who sell at the local farmers market organized and they pushed out roadblocks but the roadblocks came back and they came back with with heavier weapons Many of these weapons were provided by opposition leader Chica Ramirez or Medardo Mairena, who are two leaders of what they call a peasant movement, which really uh, is an anti-Sandinista movement, that's all it is. Uh, But they do use paid pickets and they they do have uh, good access to weapons. So the roadblocks became even more armed. Uh, It became something where, you know, it was unclear what we could do. You know, the waiting game just lasted forever, but eventually the roadblocks started having to pay less to the people who were running them. So first they were paying 500 Cordobas a day, which is about twice what people normally earn here, two and a half times what people normally earn here. Then they were getting paid 300 Cordobas a day, which is still a great salary here. Then they were being offered 100 Cordobas a day, but you know, of course all the alcohol they could drink, all the marijuana they could smoke, all the food they could eat. Uh, but th- as as the money started to, to go down, the roadblocks started to get in fights with one another, and they were getting in armed fights with one another. It was turning into just sort of ridiculous. There wasn't really a, a political purpose to it. Uh, you know, there's very few people who have been involved in roadblocks who have any proposal whatsoever for the country. They're, most of them are just paid pickets. Uh, so the population, you know, over this period of time has become increasingly... Uh, organized, increasingly armed, and as they start to harass the roadblocks, they started covering their faces because, uh, you know, as I, I haven't had a chance to describe to you, but Santa Anisas have been uh, all over the country, have had their photos published on right-wing websites, have had their names published on right-wing websites. There's been lists published of businesses that should be burned down for not supporting the strike of the of the opposition. They've, uh, you know, in many cases they show somebody's picture and the next day the person's attacked. So under this incredible sense of threat and violence, and it was a real uh, risk all the time. Every time my wife left the home, it was like, uh, it's like living under war, you know, it's a sense. And during the 80s, the Contra never invaded the cities. They never really took a major city when all of a sudden this violence is happening in all of our cities. So... Under those conditions, with the police in the barracks, many people figured out a way to get armed uh, to protect themselves. Many people built up the walls around their house. Other people moved into friends' houses. So there's been this monumental process of self-organizing. I don't think it's been a a violent process. It's been a, a process of getting organized and, and recognizing the conditions under which we're living, which is that uh, if the people don't do anything about it, this government's going to fall. And if it falls, uh, 
all of us could be targets. And so, um, you know, I haven't seen what the, the famous pro-government paramilitaries, there is a, a situation in which there are uh, civilians who cover their faces when they're doing vigils around uh, city centers. And there's also police that cover their faces when they're pushing out the roadblocks. So at a certain point here, Max, probably the first uh, major uh, offensive of the government, counteroffensive of the government, was on June 19th, exactly two months after the beginning of the protests, when they liberated all the, the routes, all the highways to get into Messiah and got to the beleaguered police station, which had been there for 60 days under siege by, by uh, anti-government gangs. Uh, then after that, slowly across the country, uh, police started taking out these roadblocks. And, uh, you know, outside of the country, this is all presented as total repression against nonviolent protesters. Inside the country, the police are heroes because they're the ones who have been uh, dying to enable Nicaraguans to return to peace. Yeah, so um, the death toll is something like 380 or 430 or something around there, around 400. Um, and you know how I know that this there was a regime change operation afoot. And when I say a regime change operation, I mean an attack not just on a government, but on the nation state and you know a plan to reduce a country to a failed state like Libya is that Ken Roth surfaced after the, the Nicaraguan government had essentially won and removed the roadblocks, allowing the economy, which had bled $500 million, uh, to start functioning again, allowing citizens to start moving around. Ken Roth, the dictator of Human Rights Watch, who's st you know been in the same position for 25 years, catering to a small cadre of billionaires and elite foundations with almost no constituency base, uh, blamed the government for every single death, uh, meaning that zero Sandinistas died, according to Ken Roth. Uh, Mike Pence has basically said the same thing. Uh, we met Enrique Hendricks, who carried out a forensic study of the death counts, which have been tabulated by Anne de PDH, uh, which is a, you know, the main human rights group here that used to be funded by the U.S., was founded in Miami. And it's where the, you know, U.S. Congress gets all its statistics from. And even this opposition human rights group, when he went person by person, he found that this researcher, Enrique Hendricks, found that about 60 people had died who were government supporters, Sandinistas, and about the same amount died who were involved in not just the protest, but were involved in armed activity to overthrow the government, um, who may have been actually shooting at uh, police or citizens. Uh, the rest of the people, there were duplicate deaths, there were bystanders, there were people who died in accidents during that period. And so the death toll has been totally manipulated, as it was in Venezuela, where the majority of people who died in the Garimbas, recent ones, were on the opposition side. People have been burned on the government side. Basically, the whole information, um, all of the information that we are getting outside of Nicaragua is slanted towards one side and it, there's a push to sanction this government now in the U.S. Congress led by Ileana Ross Leitonen, part of the Hydra of Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio and Ross Leitonen, who are kind of Cuban-American right-wing exiles and they want to start attacking Nicaragua's economy. Uh, Nicaragua's economy has been making a lot of achievements these past few years. I think we've been looking at 5% growth each year. I mentioned that I'd been here before Ortega was elected, and the country has been transformed in many ways. Managua has certainly been transformed. Just visiting the city center and seeing um, the Salvador Allende port where public space has been created for families and food and really nice restaurants is subsidized. Uh, there's there used to be it used to be a terrifying place to walk around and now it's it's beautiful um and it's much safer than downtown washington dc is at night um th this is a mixed economy uh where a lot of it a lot of things are subsidized to make life easier for workers um but people have been doing well until the sanctions started coming in like the global magnitsky act and what these sanctions did um the first with the magnitsky act 
was to threaten businesses that would work with the government. And so it forced a lot of these businesses or pressured them to join the coup. Um, and now we're going to see a deepening attack on the economy. So what, I want to ask, you know, what are you expecting here in the next few months, in the next year? And what is at stake? Because I think a lot of people have been listening to this and getting a lot of details. But why does the United States want to destabilize Nicaragua, a country that presents no threat to it whatsoever? Yeah, you know, that's a, it's a tough one. I think internally there's one situation. Uh, externally there's an entirely different one. Internally, you know, the, the greatest threat that Nicaraguans face is, is the, uh, the penetration of hatred into our lives, right? The, the way that using fake news and social media, disturbing images, uh, we could lose ourselves and become like other Central American countries where organized crime uh, is rampant and uh, human life has lost much of its, its uh, value. You know, we haven't had that here. It's a country where uh, kids feel safe playing in the street all, all evening, where people can walk home from work at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, where you can get drunk in, in the street, and the only thing that will happen is someone will put a, a newspaper over you so you don't catch a cold. It's an interesting country in that sense, you know. And uh, the idea that we could hate each other is really terrible. And the fact that through this combination of citizens getting organized, the government having a very conciliatory tone throughout, and eventually the police clearing up the roadblocks has really created sort of a, a pathway towards reconciliation and peace here. That's really important to be clear about. Nicaragua can heal from what it's been through in the last three months. Uh, it has to be an honest... Uh, it, can't, it, ha it can't be a one-sided reconciliation. This is not just a, a government defeat of a coup attempt. It's, it's really a, uh, the Nicaraguan people coming together to realize that they need to live together in peace, whatever their differences of opinion are, and look for democratic solutions to democratic problems, right? So that's one side of it. The other side of it is that now that the opposition, the hardcore opposition, has been defeated entirely, uh, militarily, it's it's been defeated in terms of its popular support. It's been defeated in terms of uh, having any cards to play. It's just shown everything it had, right? It, this was its one big chance. The, the preachers who are in favor of the coup have shown themselves. The priests who are in favor of the coup have shown themselves. And so it's a really, it's, a, an, ex, it's ex, an exhausted attempt. So what they've done is is immediately focus on the international arena. And uh, as you know, it's, it's a very tough moment for the left in Latin America. There's been lots of defeats lately. Uh, and the big economies uh, have been controlled by the right again, right? Argentina and Brazil. The election of Lopez Obrador in Mexico is very important, but he hasn't taken office yet. Uh, but in general, it's, it's a, the worst context of maybe the last 12 years in Latin America. And that means that uh, Nicaragua doesn't have the votes to defend it at the Organization of American States. Uh, it was being defended uh, by, by by Nicaraguan uh, Chancellor Denis Moncada, along with the chancellors of Venezuela and Bolivia. Uh, of course, Cuba doesn't participate in the Organization of American States. Um, and the United States, which has developed its capacities to affect uh, the economies of other countries to a phenomenal degree, right? It's no longer a blockade. It's no longer sanctions uh, in the old sense, but it's these very highly sophisticated uh, forms of financial war that they're able to carry out a, a, on a country. Look, Nicaragua is getting its name dragged to the dirt. <laughs> its peace is uh, being called dictatorship around the world. If the Sandinista Front were pulled out of power by force, this country would be plunged into chaos. We, they're talking about a death toll of 300 people. There would be 30,000 people to begin with in the first year if the, the Sandinista Front were taken out of power by force. So the first thing it, we need to be clear about is that the solution to this will require democratic methods, uh, 
and the de- the Sandinista Front can't be taken out by force. But unfortunately, because the Nicaraguan people have survived this militarily, the European Union, the big NGOs, the United States, uh, the World Bank, all of the the organizations that have played a small but key role in Nicaragua's economic growth of the last decade are pooling their support right at the time when the public infrastructure here has been decimated by this uh, regime change operation. So it's a very dismal uh, outlook right now. The long-term outlook, I'd say, is that the Sandinista Front's stronger than before, so politically there could be some stability that comes out of this, uh, we hope. But economically, it's going to be very, very difficult for Nicaragua to rebuild without having access to credit, without having access to uh, loans, and having this the continued sort of psychological war against potential investors in this country. I want to ask you about one of the groups that has been sending people around the world to clamor for, and not explicitly, but to implicitly clamor for this economic attack on Nicaragua uh, under left-wing guise, under the guise of Sandinismo. Um, I'm referring to the MRS, the Movement for the Renovation of the Sandinistas. Um, They're a party that has participated in Nicaraguan politics and typically polls around like 2%. Um, I was here when they were at their height um, in the 2007 election where they got something like 12% or 9%, 6%. Okay. I doubled the, I was a little bit favorable to them. Uh, I doubled it. They got 6%. So that was their high point. Um, but they poll really well among like, uh, you know, the Western intelligentsia and the NGO world. Um, they poll really well among like the open society Institute and USAID and they head up many of the foundations, these MRS figures. Um, and they have played a really important role in dividing the Western left on the question of Nicaragua right now. Um, and painting Daniel Ortega, not only as a dictator, but as a figure with very little popular support. Um, one of these figures, uh, Oscar Rene Vargas, recently called. Uh, he's in France now. He recently went on the opposition channel here, Cien Percento Noticias, and called for hundreds of people, Nic- average Nicaraguans, to die uh, attacking El Carmen, which is the neighborhood where Daniel Ortega and his family live. Um, and he said, you know, so what? Hun- hundreds of people will die, but that's what will produce the change we want to see. Um, his son, actually, um, I ran into him the other day. He had denounced his father as a golpista, as a, as a coup monger. So this is these. This is the MRS. Um, you know, t- t- talk about their history, and then you know, give me your impression of uh, reading online uh, the debate that's taking place on social media and in various uh, journals among self-proclaimed leftists about Nicaragua. Uh, reading that from Tipi Tapa, uh, having just experienced uh, months uh, a months-long coup attempt. I think that uh, for decades, probably for centuries, the elite have done politics, right? And everybody else uh, has the job of just sort of carrying out uh, the economic activity that allows the elite to stay where they are. And in Nicaragua, that model uh, lasted for uh, decades and decades until the 1920s when out of a civil war that the United States uh, got involved in and used as a pretext to occupy the country, a figure named uh, Augusto Cesar Sandino formed his own army uh, to fight against the U.S. presence here. And that army was based upon the idea of a difficult struggle in which elite would cede ground to workers and to peasants because only workers and peasants have the strength to carry out a long-term struggle uh, for their own interests uh, that's capable of beating imperialism. That was his thesis. And he was really the developer of guerrilla warfare in the Americas. He was the first person to use it. It was successful. 
the U.S. Marines left Nicaragua after six years of occupation. And then Sandino was betrayed and killed by Somoza. The Somoza regime got started. But w the reason that's important to, to keep in mind is that when the Sandinista Revolution uh, successfully took power in 1979, there was a combination of oligarchy families that were very unhappy with Somoza, as well as young revolutionaries from all social classes. So several, several of the top level, very top level, cabinet level uh, cadre of the Sandinista Front during the 1980s were in fact the children of these oligarchy families. For example, the Cardinal Brothers, who were the ministers of education and culture, as well as uh, Carlos Fernando Chamorro, who was the editor of La Barracada. So during that time, there was a there there was a role for this sort of the black sheep of these oligarchy families to get, to get to be revolutionaries in that context. But as soon as the Sandinista Front lost power in 1990, there was an exodus of these children of the oligarchy from the party because they were used to being ministers. They didn't want to have to be opposition figures in an opposition party. They didn't want to have to defend the gains of the revolution out on the street, fighting cops. They didn't want to uh, suffer with the Nicaraguan people. Many of them left and bought houses in Los Angeles or in Miami or in Spain. Many of them went on to write books. Uh, and what's interesting Giaconda is that... Belli. Yeah, Giaconda Belli, right? Belli is one of the other uh, you know, famous oligarchy families here in Nicaragua. So these people have led their, their illustrious lives. They've maintained contact in some cases with the U.S. solidarity activists who gave their time, their energy, their sweat, sometimes their lives to support the Sandinista Revolution, and who were often able to make good friends with people who spoke English, people who had high-level positions in the Sandinista Front. So the ex-Sandinistas have always sort of had the ear of the U.S. and European left. And this party, the MRS, was formed out of a combination of legitimate grievances with the Sandinista Front at the 1994 Congress, as well as sort of a social democratic tendency, which at the time wanted to reject Marxism, said that socialism was a, a passé idea, and wanted to form new alliances. Uh, so once that party was formed, uh, they they sort of started to create their own idea for what they could do. They never had popular support. They never did uh, neighborhood organizing like the Sandinista Front had. And they never went out to defend the gains of the revolution. So as soon as they went into an election, you know, they, they were able to garner only this, this classic 2%. Meanwhile, the Sandinista Front, with all of its heirs, uh, stuck with the large majority of the people suffered with the large majority of the people and has never had less than 35 percent support here so that's really a key to to start to understand these these two political forces that sort of claim the sandino tradition uh there's a little bit more to it there's um, a, a figure named monica boldadano uh, who uh, has sort of an ultra left analysis so we have the MRS, which is a social democratic uh, analysis, which is the, it's the MRS movement for Sandinista renovation. And then there's an ultra-left MRS, which is the movement for the rescue of Sandinismo. In both cases, the, the intellectual left-sounding arm of reactionary politics in Nicaragua, which have... Uh, continually tried to destroy the Sandinista Front and destroy historical memory of struggle to enable uh, the elite to turn s Nicaragua into a copy of, of several other countries where the left has never been able to successfully take power and run a country. The, the secret here, what makes Nicaragua different, is that there's a historical memory of defeating the Somoza regime and defeating the elite and building a, a popular basis for a nation and that memory is what uh, allows Nicaraguans to face imperialism. It's, it's, it's a constant source of, of strength and that's what they're going after.
So that's my take on the, the MRS. They're very strong outside of the country. They're very weak within the country. There's not one MRS member in Tipi Tapa because it's a very working class city. There's, I would doubt that there's any working class MRS members in all of Nicaragua. They do hold enormous sway over the NGO sector. And they are who has been the most agile in receiving foreign support in this country. Well, it looks like for now the right wing and the tranquistas and the NGO left uh, have failed in Nicaragua. Uh, we'll see what happens over the coming months um, as they come back for more. Uh, they've left behind a trail of chaos. And I think uh, you are living through that right now. You've asked me to keep this interview short and <laughs> we went over an hour uh, because you have to drive home at night and it's not safe getting back from Managua to Tipi Tapa. That wasn't the case before April uh, when this chaos began to unfold. So I'll, <laughs> you know, I'll let you get on the road, uh, Niels McCune, but that was an incredible discussion. Uh, I learned a lot and I hope everyone else did. Uh, this is Moderate Rebels. I'm Max Blumenthal. Uh, in Managua, Nicaragua. Uh, I got a flight back tonight and I'll be producing several articles and a documentary in the coming days and months. So look out for that. And uh, you can support this show at patreon.com uh, slash moderate rebels. Uh, thanks again for listening. <laughs>